All right, well, uh, <laughs> thank you, Alan. Um, I guess I'll get started. Um, so this is uh, for, for those who uh, came to Sean and my paper at uh, AES. This is uh, very similar, if not identical, but <laughs> um, back in October, November in LA. But uh, anyhow, as I've learned many times, you need to hear something at least seven times before you remember it. So I'll probably have to do this five more times before you guys understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> five more times. So, um, first of all, I want to say this was kind of, uh, say, a bit unusual for, uh, for me and listen to do a, uh, a joint paper presentation with uh, another company, and uh, it surprisingly worked out very well, and I want to thank the Harmon team for that. Um, it wasn't just Sean, it was also uh, Todd Welty and uh, Elizabeth McMullen, as well as uh, Steve Tatarun is helping me at listen. So, yeah. It's amazing what you can do when you put a bunch of brains together on the same topic. So why did we do this? Well, really the uh, motivation I'm going to talk about in a minute um, is, is very important. And the way we divided up the work uh, seemed to make sense is we know how to make measurements and uh, Sean and Harmon know how to do subjective listening tests. And as you can imagine, it's uh, extremely uh, well, I'll say difficult and time-consuming to do the listening test, although, quite frankly, measurements can be very time-consuming and difficult. But anyhow, we didn't have the uh, trained listening panel like Sean did, so it, it just worked out very naturally that way. That We'd do the measurements, they would do the listening test, and then we would compare results and see what we get. So the motivation. So it's been, as you probably know, I've done a lot of papers on uh, distortion measurements, and it's kind of been my lifelong quest to figure out uh, what distortion is uh, audible, as well as um, subjective amount of distortion. So I always like to point out that uh, there's really, um, I'll call it two levels of uh, well, not subjective. There's the objective side of what's perceived. In other words, can we hear it or can't we? And even that's a bit fuzzy because it depends a lot on the listener's age, um, their hearing, and even their sex. <laughs> so it's first and foremost, my goal is to try to figure out whether the average person can hear it. And then once we get beyond that, my next goal is to figure out um, if you can hear it, how good or how bad does it sound? And that's obviously um, very subjective. Um, I think we can, Sean can speak to whether there's some average preference, um, a lot more so than me. But my uh, key focus is really on whether it's audible or not. So that requires uh, implementing a well-controlled experiment to isolate the nonlinear from the linear distortion. And that turns out to be extremely difficult, um, and we'll go into that in a moment. And then, of course, um, getting back to what I'll call the subjective and the objective side. So does the program material, does the music or even speech, what we're listening to, affect the audibility? So again, can we hear the distortion at all? And if we can hear it, is it bad or good? And then, uh, really, the whole purpose of uh, the mission of LISTEN is to try to not just measure stuff, but to correlate it to uh, human perception. Um, I mean, there's certainly arguments for measuring things for the sake of measuring them for standards and whatnot. Um, there's also, from a reliability point of view, so there are things that you can measure that you can't hear but are important with respect to reliability, like on a production line. But most of you guys, I would assume, are probably also interested in um, whether the distortion, if it's audible, is it, does it sound good or bad? Because that's going to determine how you design the product. So this is not just from a manufacturing point of view, like rub and buzz, which I think everyone would say, yeah, that's not part of the design, per se. 
and that is something we obviously want to catch before we ship it to the customer. But there's a whole another level of, you know, I'm trying to make a small product or I'm trying to make an inexpensive product. What can I get away with in terms of pleasing my customers and my marketing people, who knows, my management? And that's in a very uh, delicate uh, situation where you try to figure out what can you get away with and still have something that's acceptable without spending too much money. So for this uh, project, we wanted to um, use headphones. Now, we could have used loudspeakers, and certainly um, one of my goals is to apply this to loudspeakers, but it's just a lot easier to work with headphones, and in particular, headphones have become very popular lately, and uh, a lot of people are spending a lot of money on headphones. So headphones have the advantage of being a, what I'll call a well-controlled listening environment. Not perfectly, because um, uh, Linkwitz, uh, Siegfried, even, Siegfried Linkwitz even pointed out to me just 10 minutes ago that even everyone's ear canal is different, as if that's another uh, room, acoustic room. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, but it's still a lot simpler than, for example, this listening room. Um, so we went and uh, just picked out what we thought were some representative headphones. Um, five popular over-the-ear headphones retailing for $250 or more that cover a wide range of technologies were selected for the study. Um, in particular, we selected uh, over-the-ear headphones because we thought, A, they would be more repeatable from a positioning point of view. And again, if you're going to make measurements, your, one of your biggest problems is getting repeatability. So we got headphones that went over the ear so we could get, especially at low frequencies, good seals. Um, the other thing is we, of course, wanted to use some sort of uh, reference standard um, to compare the other headphones to. And this was uh, one of my lifelong desires, believe it or not, was to buy a pair of Stax headphones. Um, so it was a good, good excuse, good tax write-off. I thought I'd have the headphones in my house by now, but they still haven't made it home. Um, they're actually at the show, <laughs> so you'll probably get to listen to them more than me, unfortunately. Um, but in any case, uh, the reason we chose the stacks was even back when I was working for B&K, where they're doing sound quality measurements. It was, it, was, it was the reference standard even there. And when you measure them, you can tell why the distortion is incredibly low. In fact, I'm not even going to show them on the measurements initially because I don't have space. And the distortion is much lower than the other ones. So um, just to not confuse people, I, I'm not going to show those measurements. They're in the paper um, if you want to see that. So we have uh, AKG 701s, one of my favorite all-time headphones. They've been around for eons. Um, and they're very straightforward, dynamic. Um, I think everyone's familiar with Beats. Um, again, closed back. Now, two of the headphones here are actually noise-canceling headphones, which have also become quite popular. And there was a big debate as to whether that was going to be a problem with equalizing them. Um, turned out not to be, which is a good thing. Um, but of course, there's a lot of things to take in consideration when measuring uh, uh, noise canceling, active noise canceling headphones and what they do, especially at low frequencies. And that's probably the topic of another paper. The, uh, so I think a lot of people are familiar with the Bose um, QC15s that now I guess have been replaced by the QC20s or whatever they're called. Um, Sony MDRs, which is a, a very popular headphone, especially for recording studio people. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the Stax headphones, electrostatic. Um, but we also plan to look at some other headphones as well, the electromagnetics like the Oppo and whatever's out there that supposedly sounds good. So here's our measurement setup. It's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, of course, it's pretty, uh, it costs some money to get a good head and torso simulator these days. Um, and in particular, if you want to do any sort of correction curves according to a standard, you pretty much have to go with uh, one of these uh, true head and torsos, not just some couplers. So this particular one is actually uh, B&K Hats. Um, Grass also makes an excellent one as well. <laughs> 
Um, so we obviously had to measure the basic frequency response and sensitivity. Um, if we we're going to do a comparison, we're going to somehow have to account for both the frequency response and the sensitivity. Actually, it turns out to be quite the challenge um, to match levels. Um, I think anyone who's done it with loudspeakers before can tell you, you can't just go measure one kilohertz and uh, adjust the level so that they're all the same output at one kilohertz because that's not how the human ear works and what happens if that one kilohertz happens to be a peak or a dip. So you have to do something a bit special to account for the uh, frequency response. And uh, we've actually used things like uh, Zwicker Loudness that seem to work pretty well. Um, Sean's going to talk about what they did according to the ITU uh, standard, but it's a challenge. And then we created equalization curves um, for each headphone that would result in all the headphones having the same target response. Now, we could have gone about this in different ways, but this was just the first step. This is what uh, Sean and Harmon's been doing for a while. What you can see down here is the uh, target response that uh, Sean has derived, which would be the uh, green curve. And then the black curve is uh, just an example of one of these headphones after it's been equalized. And you can see how close it comes to the um, target response. It's not perfect. And as I discovered in this project, equalization is, is a black science of sorts. Um, I shouldn't say it's totally black, but it really is a tricky thing to do because just e equalizing magnitude and not screwing up the time domain is very tricky. So we still need to do some work here. Sean will talk more about this. So I, of course, had to start somewhere that I thought everyone could relate to, which was uh, THD distortion measurements. Um, and what you see here is actually the uh, total harmonic distortion measured at uh, the red curve is 82 dB SPL. Uh, Orange curve is 88, um, blue is 94, and green is 100 dB SPL. Um, we did measure the individual harmonics, but again, I didn't want to overload people with data, so I just showed the four different headphones. Again, the Stax headphones, I just didn't think I could squeeze it all in here. They were lower in general, and in some cases, significantly lower. Um, so what was interesting right away, which is not very common with uh, most loudspeakers, uh, at least room loudspeakers, is that most headphones showed less distortion at low frequencies and higher levels. So let me repeat that. <laughs> Let's took it, let, look at the red curves on most of these uh, headphones. So that's actually 82 dB SPL. Below 100 hertz, uh, the distortion is uh, greater than at 100 dB SPL, significantly. Oh, and by the way, just in case you guys didn't grasp this, my scales, I decided to put the distortion in percent on a log scale. I know it's not that typical, but um, honestly, it's, we're used to looking at dB scales, log scales, and uh, I don't know why the industry is standardized on percent, but that's typically on a linear scale. So anyhow, it will magnify the differences. Um, so I could probably, uh, I won't say guess, but give an educated guess as to why this is and why it's not typically the case with uh, loudspeakers. And um, you know, I'm sure Wolfgang could expound on this, but it has a lot to do with the, uh, the suspension of a typical um, ear speaker or whatever you want to call it, the transducer, the speaker inside an earphone, typically does not have much of a surround, much of a suspension. So at low frequencies, especially I think at low levels, it's really not behaving that well. And when you start to heat it up and drive it harder, I think it starts to get softer. So you, you tend to get um, lower distortion at higher levels, which is kind of contrary to what you would imagine. Um, this is also, I've noticed with microspeakers, very common. In fact, I can't tell you how many times I get questions from customers uh, who make microspeakers telling me our equipment's all screwed up because it's given these results. But we've checked, double checked, triple checked, signal to noise, you name it, this is the reality of most uh, earphones. Now at uh, high frequencies, of course, 
and we start to see something more typical. Um, we see more distortion at high frequencies and higher levels. Again, here it's pretty obvious. Green curve is 100 dB SPL, blue curve is 94, and then it goes down with level. Um, they all pretty much do that. And you'll notice that uh, some of the uh, headphones have some, I'll call them problem areas. Um, so for example, headphone D, around the mid-range I'll call it, definitely has some uh, more distortion than the other headphones. You'll see that uh, headphone C has more distortion at the high frequencies than the other headphones. And uh, headphone B is actually pretty interesting. It's pretty uh, stable until probably some sort of cone breakup out here. But uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you which headphone's which, but you might be surprised. So anyhow, there's your THD. Is it significant? Is it audible? We'll go into that in more detail later. IM distortions, uh, typical or uh, popular distortion metric. Um, a lot of debate as to how useful it is, but in this particular case, um, we chose to use a fixed tone at 43.1 hertz. So low frequency tone, maybe it's, it's below resonance, but anyhow, the whole idea is that you have a fixed tone where you get a lot of displacement, and then a sweeping tone um, all the way up to 20 kilohertz, and you look for intermodulation. Um, now, granted, most headphones are um, what I'll call one-way. You know, they're not—they're not a uh, multi-way loudspeaker. There's no crossover, although there are plenty out there that are. Um, in any case, just by the very nature that you got uh, a fairly decent-sized driver trying to cover the entire frequency range, it inherently is going to have a lot of uh, IM distortion at high frequencies, call it Doppler distortion, but you basically have a low frequency moving the membrane, quite a displacement, and then you have a high frequency tone riding on top of it, you're going to get IM distortion. So a lot of that would disappear if you had a two-way system, but this is typically what's done in headphones. You'll notice that uh, headphone A actually seems to have more than uh, the other guys. Um, Again, the stacks were actually the lowest. Um, you also see that uh, headphone B, surprisingly again, seems to have some of the lower distortion. And headphone C is not too bad. But um, anyhow, it's a little hard to um, determine what's going on here. Uh, and I think this really requires looking at IM distortion in different ways. There is another method, which is called two sweeping tones. Um, we typically call the difference frequency distortion, where you can sweep the two tones together. And, um, what am I doing on top? and that's another useful measure. But uh, again, I didn't want to overload people with data. So this is uh, what I have for today. So why stop at two tones? Why not go to many tones? For example, multi-tone distortion. And, of course, that's really going to bring out not just harmonic distortions, but intermodulation frequencies, all kinds of stuff. Um, and here it gets pretty interesting uh, at the high frequencies again. Um, headphone C is uh, kind of unusual in that, for some reason, the 88 dB SPL kind of freaks out a little in the mid-range, where the other ones are pretty more consistent, gradually go up. That's a bit of, of a weird one to me, and I am actually don't know how to explain it. Um, the, uh, in this case, headphone D is a um, little less spread, I guess, for lack of a better word. But it's a little hard to say something jumps out at you other than headphone C in this orange curve, and then headphone B again is actually quite low compared to the other ones. So this is um, what I call non-coherent non distortion. Um, I think back many years ago, uh, Pascal Brunet and I wrote a paper on this uh, technique. Um, it's been around for a while, but it's, it's really non-coherence has been around for a long time. Um, but we wanted to apply it to distortion. So the big advantage of non-coherent distortion is you can actually use any signal as long as it's uh, dense enough in frequency and level um, to actually look at uh, non-coherent power. And of course, the theory is if you have a good signal-to-noise ratio, which you should really with headphone measurements, that most of the non-coherence is going to be due to distortion. 
So again, it will be intermodulation distortion, it will be harmonic distortion, um, but it's just a more realistic way to look at different distortion versus program material, or different. In this case, we actually used uh, music, and here I'm actually showing the, uh, the Stax headphones as well, which is the green curve. Again, they tend to be the lowest. Um, what you see here is uh, the uh, headphone D, again, is jumping out, is kind of has some issues in the, I don't know, mid-range, maybe a little lower. Um, headphone C, for some reason, has a spike around one kilohertz. You know, is, is that audible? Can we, can we discern that? And then uh, you see them overlaid and, you know, kind of some of the same trends. Um, we actually found that the uh, music material didn't change dramatically this uh, picture. Um, but in any case, I thought it was pretty interesting, as Sean will point out, um, with the correlation, the subjective side of the correlation. So again, you could use pink noise, you could use music, you could use speech. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. And if you want more details about that, it's uh, in an AES paper from 2006. All right, Sean, I think I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll go over that a little more at the end. There's two different ways of doing it, but this is with the target EQ applied. Good point. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the uh, listening test results. And uh, so as Steve said, uh, we, we first had to make recordings of each headphone, and we did this in an anechoic chamber because we needed a really quiet environment uh, and wanted to eliminate any background noise in the recordings. Uh, so we measured them on our grass 45 CA, which is a uh, with a modified, sorry, with the regular ITU pinna, and uh, we equalized them to the target. Each headphone was equalized, so the frequency response was the same. And then we made recordings uh, at different levels: uh, a low level, a medium level, and a high level. And uh, I think the high level was 94 dB average. And we did this with uh, four different programs. So the first program was Rebecca Pigeon. I don't, does everyone know this recording? It's a, a female voice with uh, acoustic bass and uh, what else? I guess you don't know this recording. This, this is a, Spanish Harlem. Spanish Harlem, yeah. So it, it's a pretty good signal for hearing distortion. That, you know, in cars we use this a lot because any kind of panel resonance or buzz or rattle, it's, it's not easily masked because the, the instrumentation is so sparse. Uh, and you have the acoustic bass that if it happens to hit the same frequency of a resonance, it's, it's quite audible, the distortion. Uh, the second piece, Joe Sample, is a uh, sort of a, uh, a sort of jazz piece that you'd hear on the wave radio. Uh, it's not real jazz, but it's very well recorded. It has a low, lot of low bass, and it, it's instrumental. Uh, the third piece was Mark Knopfler, Shangri-La, which is a vocal, electric guitar, uh, typical pop instrumentation. And the last selection was Shriekback, which has got a lot of really low bass. And uh, we, of course, we did uh, spectrum analysis of all these pieces, so it, I believe it's in the paper. You can see how much energy and uh, there is in each track, it's, so it has a lot of low frequency energy which will excite any kind of distortion and, uh, and it's fairly uh, consistent, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a, good, a good test signal. And of course, we added these into very short loops so that, that were repeated so that uh, we're trying to make the test as sensitive as possible and as easy for the listener. So uh, we then took these recordings, we added them uh, into these loops and uh, aligned them in time so that when you switch between the different headphones, uh, you could uh, easily compare uh, across them with, a, with no time delay. Uh, all the headphones were played through the replicator headphone, which Steve said was the, uh, the stacks. 
and uh, we wrote a piece of software on an iPad so that uh, it was easy to switch between these various headphones and the, the software uh, randomizes uh, the headphones as well, the order of them. So it was a pretty controlled test. Uh, there were, that sounds like one of the tracks. Uh, so the test, the test design was a five-way multiple comparison. There were five headphones, even though the software interface only shows four. Uh, we did four programs, as I said, with two observations. So there was a total of eight trials. The order of the headphone and program presentation was randomized. And uh, as Steve said, we had to remove any kind of loudness differences uh, related to the sensitivity of the headphone. So we did this using the ITUR 1770 loudness adjustment. So you, you basically measure the headphones and then you calculate the gain offset that you require in order to get the headphones to be subjectively uh, the same loudness. And we chose the, uh, the second from the top uh, playback level. So it was actually 94 dB and we decided to play it back at, at a lower playback level and this was because we didn't want to uh, you know piss off the listening subjects expose them to loud sounds and also the, the ear itself becomes very nonlinear at, at high playback levels so we wanted to again remove uh, distortion uh, uh, produced by the listeners ears as, as a variable so if we played this back at the original level uh, we're not sure at this point whether we get different results. Uh, we probably get list, uh, fewer listeners that would participate. So the listeners were eight trained listeners. They're all Harman employees and they all had uh, audiometric normal hearing. So the first thing we did was uh, just to check to see whether there were any significant differences uh, related to the variable headphone program. And we found uh, that indeed there was a significant uh, effect related to the headphone and as Steve mentioned there was also uh, an interaction between program and headphone. So here are the mean preference ratings uh, for the five headphones and you can see that uh, there was one particular headphone, headphone D, which was moderate to strongly uh, less preferred to the other headphones. Uh, but as, in terms of headphones A, B, D, sorry, C and E, listeners really had difficulty discriminating uh, between these four headphones. That's not to say there weren't subjective or audible differences between them, but uh, given a choice between one or the other, people really had trouble saying, I prefer this one over that one. So in, in terms of uh, a real or a significant difference in terms of affecting your preference, uh, when you equalize the headphones to the same frequency response, the distortion wasn't really a factor uh, with the exception of headphone D. So here are the, the mean preference ratings as a function of program for each of, the, each of the headphones. And you can see the headphone D, which was overall the least preferred headphone, the scores really went down when the music was Shriek Back or Rebecca Pigeon. Uh, but you can see for Rebecca Pigeon, uh, when it was played through headphones C and D, it produced the highest rating. So you can see that, uh, that the preferences uh, were affected by the program material, and, and you would expect that because uh, if, if the, the distortion in the headphone happens to align with a, a, the frequency of the music and it's sufficiently loud, then that's a factor. Uh, the Rebecca Pigeon, as I said, is very a good program because it's very sparse, so you, there's not much masking going on. So if there's any buzz or anything in the headphone, it's, it's quite audible on that program. Uh, so here we show the individual listener uh, preferences for each headphone. And you can see that it's, it's relatively consistent that, uh, with a couple of exceptions, that most listeners rate it headphone D last. Uh, so... But in terms of the other headphones, most of the listeners had trouble discriminating among the, the other four headphones. And you can see that some listeners, uh, particularly listener 53 and, and 363, they really had difficulty with this test and they, they couldn't reliably formulate any preference among these headphones. <laughs> 
So in, in addition to preference, we also ask people to give comments which might explain some of their underlying preferences. And in the paper, we, we sort of uh, list them, but I'll just summarize them here. And uh, generally, people reported that headphone D, the least preferred headphone, had audible distortion, which they described as buzz, buzzing, uh, noisy, fuzzy, harsh, uh, muddy bass. For the other headphones, listeners reported that uh, there were no consistent uh, audible distortions. And in cases where they were reporting them, if you looked across the trials, it was really inconsistent. So uh, they were really guessing. Uh, we also uh, found that listeners reported small timbre differences. And you know this could be related to distortion, but more likely they were probably related to uh, timbre or EQ errors related to measurement errors of leakage, for example. So, so we tried to, uh, when we equalized the headphones, uh, the EQ was based on a really an average of several measurements, but uh, we're making assumptions that the leakage we're measuring on the headphone, on the coupler, is going to be consistently reproduced uh, on listeners, and that obviously wasn't always the case even though we, we selected a headphone, a, a replicator headphone that uh, was generally good in terms of fit. So just to summarize the, uh, the correlation between the objective and the subjective measurements, uh, if you look at the total harmonic distortion measurement, uh, headphone D, which was the least preferred headphone, also had the highest measured THD below 100 hertz. So uh, that was that was good correlation, and we also found that headphone D, which was the second least preferred headphone, sorry, headphone C, headphone C. Uh, listeners described that as harsh. It also had the highest THD above one kilohertz. So again, if you're very selective in how you interpret the measurements, you can find correlations. In terms of intermodulation distortion, uh, headphone A had the highest measured IM distortion above 1K, but it was also pretty highly rated, so we concluded that that, that represents poor correlation. In terms of multi-tone distortion, headphone A, B, C had the highest distortion uh, using this metric, and yet it was rated very high, so uh, we found that there was poor correlation with this particular distortion measurement. As far as non-coherent distortion goes, uh, which is based on a measurement of music, uh, headphones D and C had the highest amount of distortion using this metric, so that represents good, dis good correlation. Headphone E, which was the most preferred headphone, also had the lowest amount of non-coherent distortion. So again, uh, an indication that it's a, it's, a, it's a better way to measure distortion. But uh, I think ultimately uh, <coughs> distortion based on a perceptual model using the music signal would probably yield the best predictions of sound quality. So uh, just to go over the conclusions, uh, we found that there was a significant effect of nonlinear distortion on headphone preference, but the effect was largely limited to headphone D. Uh, listener comments more or less confirmed that headphone D had audible distortion. And none of the distortion measurements could consistently identify the headphone with the most and least audible distortion. And uh, uh, if, if we were going to expand this work, we'd include a wider range of poor, uh, poor quality headphones, less expensive, and with, with the goal that hopefully they have more distorted sound, uh, to see if we could uh, find better correlations between listening and objective measurements. Uh, I think what this paper leads to is that we need a, a more perceptual-based approach for measuring the audibility of nonlinear distortion. And, I expect that's what uh, Steve's going to be working on. And finally, uh, uh, at the booth, at the listen booth, uh, Steve's going to be showing uh, a demonstration of, of uh, these headphones uh, using the iPad application. And that's it. Thank you. measurements in ear when they listen inside the headphones when it's on the listener's head.
do the distortion method? Yeah, just put a microphone in, have a microphone inside it, just well, to see what to the, the coupler. Re, yes. Well, in addition to the coupler, to see where the was consistency of the sound field inside the inside the cup. No, and and that's, I guess the question there is like if you were using a real human, yeah. that would make a lot of sense to me. But if you're using a dummy head, I assume that you should watch the other thing. Just the measurement guys. <laughs> uh, well, I was one of the listeners, so you. <laughs> oh, well, I think that. No. <laughs> But yeah. no, we I, we didn't actually do it for this test, but we, we have been doing it for other tests. And uh, often when we find a lot of variability amongst listeners and their opinions, and we, we measure the signals at their ears, we, we can explain why their opinions are so variable. And it's usually related to leakage. Yeah, so, so in theory, at least, you could listen to what somebody could listen to, albeit picked up with a microphone. Yeah. Um, with respect to your um, findings or results in terms of the correlation between the IM and the multitone, I think you said something that may point to that. You may have simply been unlucky with your choice of the low frequency tone for that particular headphone since you fixed that. I don't know. That's just, that's just one possibility that you might want to explore move that around and, and try. I mean, it means a lot more data. I mean, it, but it's a good example where the music material Right. Exactly. It, it does it uh, you, where you get a more broad uh, right. Does stimulus. Right. Excite the uh, nonlinearity. Yeah. Doesn't it? And so that's hard. It's hard to say because there was only one IM test with one particular fix, and for headphone A may have been unlucky, right. or the other ones may have been lucky. With right. respect. So, and my question, my other question is, did, have you looked or do you plan to look at the correlation between the amount of EQ required to meet the target and the quality rating? In other words, if, if one had a really disparate natural response as measured on the mannequin and it required a really excessive amount of EQ to meet the target, how would that impact its its rating in the simulation? I think that might be interesting. Yeah, I mean, in this case, we uh, all these headphones had a pretty generous amount of bass, right? Yeah, we were bass. we were actually turning down the bass in order to meet the target, uh, and and the target we show here doesn't have any bass boost. It's it's flat, which is actually not not the target we would recommend, but. Uh, in the interest of not exciting distortion in the headphone and, and boosting the EQ, we, we chose that. And in this particular case, I don't think the EQ was a factor. But it certainly would be on, on other headphones. I mean, for example, the boost that you require around 2.7, a lot of headphones don't have that and should. And if you have a really high boost, then the Yeah, I actually have thought about trying to do this experiment a little differently where we record the, uh, the headphones unequalized and then we actually equalize the recording, the, the, um, the recorded and then play back. I think that would remove that from the equation. Um. Just a quick question. You guys picked uh, 90 dB for your recording but played back at 80. Is there any data showing that 90 dB is a typical listening level? I mean, nowadays my wife probably hears it at 110 dB. I was going to say, if anything, it might be low, but uh, I don't know. You want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I don't. You know, 80 was the average dB, so we were, we were hitting peaks obviously much higher. Uh, none of the listeners really complained about it being too low, although you know I think your point is is well taken that many people probably listen at higher levels than than 80 dB on average. For all of our loudspeaker tests, that's typically the average level, 80 dB be weighted. So it's it's pretty consistent with how we've been testing things. That's also one of the really great things about doing this is we can record at whatever level and play back at a different level. So we could actually see, um, if we had more time, we could have tried different playback levels as well. Yeah. So the, um, the nonlinearity will not be 
Yeah, I agree, and I, again, it's uh, so that's sort of what I would like to do next. But uh, the tricky thing there was um, uh, there is a way that we have to plot the distortion where we remove the uh, fundamental, the influence of the fundamental response, and because then you know it's it's very hard to compare um, distortion curves if they all have different frequency responses. Um, so we can do that, but again, the tricky thing is getting the levels right. Uh, whereas you equalize it, it's very easy to get all the levels to be the same. But yeah. So the EQ you did on this shows the magnetic being played the same. So if you draw something to the phase frequency, there's a lot of interference difference between the reflection and the It could be a number. Yeah, we, I mean, we did uh, several repeats and took the average of that. So if there were any really high Q interference dips uh, related to position, hopefully they would. You see the same timer and bottom of the Oh, that's the bit that I would be interested Yeah, that's, that's the tricky part. And that's one of the things I notice about EQing is obviously you can EQ a flat response, but yeah. you can mess up the time response very and that was one of the things that when we when we tried EQ, and this is before we sent the headphones to Sean, you know, all of a sudden the, some of the headphones sounded more reverberant. <laughs> I was like, whoa, that can't be right. So, you know, we did an inverse IIR filter and yeah. did a better job of it. But yeah, it's tricky. And the whole debate about phase is a tricky one. Were all of your uh, headphones the, using the standard? Um, Nope. Using the standard uh, Mylar driver, the pancake, or did you find some with a loudspeaker construction where you have a firm diaphragm and a soft surround? Do you know? Yeah. Because your distortion looked—it it didn't look like it was all that different from model to model. I did some measurements oh, a year or so ago and found the difference between some of the Mylar and the better constructed ones, like a magnitude of order. But it was in the mid range, not the low yeah. frequencies. Yeah, I suspect the same. Unfortunately, I can't rip apart the headphones and oh. really look at them carefully. So some you of them I knew, some of them I'm not sure what's you, going on. You could rip apart those stacks because you own them. <laughs> <laughs> that would be in We know what's in there. <laughs> Actually, that one I know what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing was you, you mentioned some of the listeners discern no differences. And I wondered. Um, if that would be due to their a big difference in their ear canal size, because when you measure when you EQ the resonance at 2.7, the ear canal resonance, that's an average, and over all of us, that can vary by up and down an octave. So, it'd be yeah, I'd be curious to find out uh, the ones that couldn't tell a difference if you check their canal size, which you can do with an ear tip too. Yeah, that's, that's what I find so tricky about these type of subjective uh, correlations. It's there, there is no average human head. Um, I, was, um, I, I was wondering, you, you, um, you, you seem to be deducing the fact that listeners um, can't tell between different headphones uh, based on the, on, on, on the fact that they give uh, sim similar ratings to, uh, to, to, to the different headphones. Um, but I mean, I, I, I imagine if I were, were a test subject and uh, and I were and, and I had to listen to two headphones that were let's say had different flaws, um, but that in the end I would say, okay, well I can I, I, I can live equally well with either one of them, but that doesn't imply that I can't hear the difference between them, and. Um, I, no. Well, the, the, this test does not prove that people couldn't hear audible differences. That's, let me make that clear. This isn't a, a threshold test. This is a preference test. So uh, people, given these five headphones, if you had to pick one you prefer, uh, that was the question. And there was clearly one that no one preferred. And the rest of them, they, they, they may well have sounded different. And you know, I, I was a subject, and they did sound different. But I couldn't reliably form a preference. 
Okay, and uh, and the related question is, is since there was clearly an interaction between uh, between the, uh, the stimuli and the and, and, and the preference, uh, were there particular stimuli in 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 which the uh, the, the let, let's, let's say the error bars in, were much smaller, or where you get much stronger correlation between the preference and and and, and the headphone. Yeah, I mean it's true there was a uh, there was a significant interaction between program and preference, and it was there was clearly one or two headphones where it was uh, most of the variance was that could be attributed to. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you carefully chose your programs, you could get a, a different result, perhaps. And uh, so uh, we'd have to test more programs and more headphones if we wanted to, you know, more generalize the, the conclusions. I, th I think I think in essence, probably the 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 the, the problem is is the same both uh, in a subjective test as in an objective test, in that you're trying to to, to capture a very very complex behavior in a single number. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Well, we want to thank Steve and Sean. Mm -hmm. One more question. Uh, I guess that's tricky. <laughs> Steve, on uh, one of the distortions going in Uh, no, but um, so for example, like the uh, one of the headphones that someone described was sounding buzzy. It, it was. It didn't have rub and buzz, but I mean, it was that, that was a descriptor. It was interesting. It's always interesting to hear how people describe sound. Um, but for my as far as I could tell, there was no rub and buzz in that um, headphone. But yes, what we're trying to do is actually um, expand on that model. You know, but our model right now is all based on frequency masking, frequency masking, not time masking. And one of the things that was pretty clear to me after doing this was the uh, program material, where you had like a, uh, a call it a base note, a transient, and then. I'll call it silence. That you're you're not getting any. Uh, the frequency masking might be okay, but the time masking is, is not okay, and that's very hard to. Uh, we're trying to expand our model to take that into account. It's very tricky. So this is clearly trying to get us to improve our perceptual model or algorithm. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Thank you.